reach that time, I'll go ahead and get started. I know people are still coming in, that's perfectly fine. I want to welcome everyone to uh, the latest installment of our speaker series for the Menard Family George Washington Forum. I uh, introduce myself, I'm Corporate the Director of the, of the Forum and Associate Professor of Economics here at Ohio University. Thank you very much for choosing to spend the, time, uh, the evening with us and the, with the rain and other events that are going on. I want to thank the Menard family and our other supporters who, through their generosity, make events like these possible. And we're grateful to have a, a, a setting where we can bring community together with faculty and students to discuss really interesting and challenging ideas. And so thank you for being with us. Also want to thank Cameron Dunbar, our program coordinator. I want to give a big thanks to OU Event Services for their help and Brandon Logan of Cremedia for the videography. To, to introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Derek Donai, uh, he is the Peter and Sue Freitag Associate Professor of Economics at Flagler College and a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. And uh, as the name of that institute sort of hints at, his approach to economics may be slightly outside the norm, and we'll get a, a feel for that uh, this evening. So his scholarship, teaching, and method for engaging diverse ideas are a testament to the fruits of a well-rounded education. He started college as a biology major with a minor in literature, but he was drawn to economics by the elegance and insight of game theory as a way to understand the world and the social underpinnings of our day-to-day -day lives. He went on to study law, completing his JD at the Whittier College School of Law, before completing a PhD in economics at George Mason University. And with a special emphasis on using his economic insight to understanding the history, the function, and the efficiency of formal and informal institutions. So Dr. Yonai is a scholar who strives to understand various perspectives on any single issue, and his broad knowledge and experience helps him to do so. His background in literature, for instance, offered training and empathy. For instance, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath helps us to feel what Tom or Ma or Rosa Sharon Joe feel throughout their plight of leaving the Dust Bowl, making their way to, to California for those promises of having a job, finding work, finding paradise, only to realize the promise will never come to fruition. Experience working in biology helps one to develop a respect for epistemology and empiricism when trying to understand the human condition. Economics offers a way to understand human motivation and human action in our social world. Likewise, training in legal theory provides a means for forming a concept of justice and a sense of the implications of a system with or without justice and the subsequent effects on human flourishing. Please help me welcome Dr. Derek and I to Ohio University and our family George Washington Forum. Thank you, Derek. Dr. O'Day, thank you for that very nice introduction. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you being here tonight in spite of the weather and spending the time with me. What I'm going to talk about today is business education, relationships, and making the world a better place. Right now, they seem like three very different topics, but I promise by the time we're done, we're going to bring them all together and show how they're all interconnected with each other. So. Back in 1982, the Center for Media Research, they decided to go out and survey TV shows to see how it is business people are portrayed. And what they found was that about half of the corporate heads engaged in illegal activity, about 45% of all business activity on TV was criminal, and only 3% of business people did anything remotely productive. The problem with this, if you're a business person, you understand that most of your colleagues are not criminals that if we only were productive 3% of the time and 97% of our employees were unproductive, we wouldn't be where we're at today. So we know that this isn't what reality is, and yet that's what we give people through mass media. This is how we entertain people. This is what, when we watch our entertainment, we're willing to accept the narrative. Now, you might say, well, that was, that was in the 80s. Things have changed. We're in the 21st century. Surely things have gotten better. Well, the same center took a survey in 2006, and they found that you were 21 times more likely to be killed or kidnapped by a business person than by a member of the mob. Look, I've spent a lot of time with business people, whether they're advisory board members, donors, or even future business people in terms of my students. 
And I never felt afraid that I was going to end up in the back of somebody's trunk or I was going to end up wearing cement boots. And yet this is the narrative we sell. Uh, usually I ask my students, how many of you have ever used Uber or Lyft? So I guess I'll ask all of you, how many of you have used Uber or Lyft? Didn't your parents teach you not to get in cars with strangers? You're going to end up on the back of a milk carton. But you don't. You get in some stranger's car, you get to where you're going to go, and you generally have a good time. And hopefully you have a nice conversation, but you at least get to your destination. And there's no fear that because this is a business dealing that somehow I'm going to be in the news tomorrow. And the reason I bring all this up is because of something an associate dean of mine once said. He reminded me that perception is reality. That how people perceive things defines a reality for them. And if you're a business person, this is somewhat disconcerting because if this is how we as a culture perceive you, for many people who aren't business people, that's the reality. That you're a criminal, that you're antisocial, that you're a plague on our society as opposed to the value creators, the people who create job opportunities, the people who operationalize our creativity to provide new goods and services to people that never existed before. But that's not how people see it. So we have to address the question of, why is that? We know you create value. We know you provide jobs. We know you help our economy grow and you pull people out of poverty. And yet, you're our go-to bad guy. Well, I have an interesting hypothesis for this. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to work you down through this roadmap. As a lawyer, I like having roadmaps for everything because I think everything should have a punchline. Otherwise, it's just a meandering story. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with how business is taught. How does we teach business in business schools? And then we're going to move on to how business is actually relational as opposed to being transactional. And then we're going to end it with why it matters. How does understanding the proper role of business in society matter when it comes to human flourishing and human well-being? So that's our roadmap. We're going to begin over here with how we teach and end with why it all matters. So let's talk about that business education for a minute. One of the things I've been lucky with, as Dr. Rodé mentioned, I have a really weird background. I am not sort of your stereotypical anything, actually. And I'm a social scientist. I'm an economist. I'm a lawyer. I live and die in social sciences. That's why I'm interested in all this. I had never set foot in a business school until I had my first job as the chair of the philosophy of business. And I used to teach this capstone class called the philosophy of business. Students had to pass it in order to graduate. And I always thought it was funny walking in and saying, yeah, I know you have to pass my class if you want your degree. But you know what's kind of funny? I've never taken a business class before. And you're like, what? You know what's even funnier is I've never set foot in a school of business until I applied for this job. So yeah, good luck with that. And they're just like, wait, what do you mean? You're a business professor. Yeah, that's what they say. But the reality of it is, is that I'm an outsider in business schools. I've always worked in a business school. It's like I can't escape it. But I'm an outsider, and that gives me a certain perspective that insiders don't have. If you went through business education, and then you get a PhD or a DBA in business, in business and then you teach in business, from my perspective, you've been within that silo your entire career. I, on the other hand, I'm the outsider looking in, and I have the liberty to go, wait, you do that? Like, for real, that's, that's like what you, seriously? And I get to have that perspective because I never had the Kool-Aid. I never drank the punch. And for me, it's a nice way of being able to say, do, maybe we need to rethink this a little bit. Maybe we need to rethink how it is we do what it is we do, how it is we teach, and approach it from a much more humane perspective. So here's the problem. Most business schools are really good at training hands. That's my shorthand for it. We're really good at teaching people how to get a job, how to do work, how to make money. We're really good at providing the ability for our students to have skills acquisition and go out and repeat those skills and earn money repeating those skills. The problem is, is that if you learn how to do business, and that's all you focus on, you never get the opportunity to ask the question, why do we do business? Why do these skills matter? Why do these tools matter? What am I supposed to do with these things? Where do I fit in society? 
If it's just about vocational hands training, then we're leaving the other half of the human being completely unfulfilled and unguided in terms of what the moral responsibility is, the ethical responsibility, the why. Why you're gonna go out there and earn money. Why it is these skills matter. And that's our big problem, is that we're too busy training our students' hands and we're not focusing on the big picture. So the way I argue it is that we ignore the soul of what business is about. That business is actually a very dignified profession where we get to help people take that innate creativity of theirs and bring something new to the field and bring something new to humanity. It's a very soulful, very joyful vocation and yet we've turned it into vocational training. Now, sometimes people say things like, accrediting bodies, that'll fix it, AACSB or ACBSP, the two big business school accreditors. Well, surely accreditation will fix this problem, right? Because you have to have curriculum, you have to, in the words that scare faculty in business schools, close the loop because you have to assess and make sure you do what you're doing. Here's the problem with accreditation. Business faculty are just like other human beings. We don't like doing more work than we have to. And the problem with assessment is that it's much more difficult to assess critical thinking. It's much more difficult to assess reading and writing and comprehension and ethics and philosophy than it is to assess, do you know how to use Excel? Do you know how to do a marketing plan? Do you know how to do accounting? Can you do supply and demand? So what ends up happening because of accreditation, we end up taking our student learning outcomes and turning them into things that we can easily measure, which is skills acquisition. Can monkey see and monkey do? Because I can measure that, I can have metrics for that, and I can report that. It's much more difficult to ask, do my students know how to effectively critically think? I'll give you one example. I was at a school of business we had as our student learning outcome for the School of Business that our students will write well. Well, AACSB came and visited and we were left with we needed to address this. And instead of addressing how do we assess writing, the faculty solution was, we'll just get rid of the student learning outcome. We're not English professors, we don't know how to assess that, we'll just get rid of that. That'll solve the problem. I was new at the time at this university, so I raised my hand, they're like, Yes, I just want to make sure I'm on the same page with everybody. We were told we need to assess this better, correct? Yes, but we're gonna say it's too hard, so instead of assessing it, we're just going to delete it. Yes. Am I the only person who thinks this is a problem? And everybody looked at me like I had two heads, like, no, dude, you wanna make it easier to assess, you want it easier to, to measure. And this is a huge issue for us. It creates essentially this Gresham's Law application. So in economics, Gresham's Law is this idea that once you start putting funny money out there and you start devaluing your currency, people want to hide real money because it has real value. So it's bad money drives out good money is the idea of Gresham's Law. And my analogy here is that soulless business education continues to drive out the soul of business. That in our attempt to be accredited in our attempt to measure whether or not we're doing our job, we end up doing more of a disservice to our students by just teaching them skills acquisition as opposed to teaching them what it means to be a real business leader. What does it mean to go out and create opportunities? How, does, how do all these things fit together? So my solution is we need to not only train their hands, because people do have to know what to do, but we also have to train their mind. We have to help them understand why we have business, what the purpose of business is in our society, and how to use these tools accordingly. When I used to talk to prospective parents, when parents and their kids would show up and they're like, we're trying to figure out what college to go to. My talk was always about, you know, here's the difference between where I'm at and the other schools you might visit. We want our students not only to know how to do business, we want them to understand why to do business. We want them to not only know how to use the vehicle called business to accomplish their life goals and make money, but we also want them to understand the why, how it works, why it works, what function it plays. It's kind of like understanding that business is just a tool. It's like a nail gun. And you can use that nail gun to earn money. 
But there's multiple ways to use that nail gun to earn money. You can use it to build homes, you can use it to engage in carpentry, you can build cabinetry with it, you can do things that create value for other people with that tool and earn money. Most of us would say, well, that's moral and ethical. I can also take that nail gun called business, walk up to somebody, shoot them in the kneecap, and take their wallet and get money that way too. It's the same exercise. Put finger on trigger, pull trigger, nail comes out, problem solved, have money. Unfortunately, though, if you did that, it probably would land you in jail. It's criminal. It's antisocial. But therein lies the problem. If all we do is train people how to use the nail gun of business, but we never actually spend the time talking about under what conditions are pro-social uses of this and antisocial purposes of this, if we never teach them target differentiation, how are they going to know ahead of time whether or not they're going to be using their business skills for good or using their business skills for evil? Because skills are neutral. How you use them matters. And that's the problem with vocational training, is that all we do is teach these skills and leave the rest up to whatever. We've just empowered people with this incredibly powerful tool, and then we unleash them onto the world, and we kind of hope for the best. And my argument is that, no, our responsibility as educators is to treat them and educate them holistically, to create that well-rounded business person who understands what these tools are for, how to use these tools, and more importantly, what role they play in our society. How business is actually a force for good as opposed to being a force for evil. Or closer to the 2008 financial crisis, I would tell parents, aren't you tired of hearing all these people on the radio and on the news when you ask them, gee, how did this happen? And their response is, I don't know, I just did what we were trained to do. Well, that's not an excuse. Yes, you were trained how to do this, but you should have had the wisdom and the judgment to understand, why are you giving a loan to somebody who can never repay it? How does that make sense? Well, the incentives were provided for us by the Fed. Yeah, 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 I get it. The incentives were provided by the Fed. I'm an economist. I teach this stuff too. But at some point, judgment has to kick in and say, I have this relationship with this person as a client. Am I doing them a service if I put them in a position to ruin their credit? Am I doing them a service if I put them in a position to ruin their life because they can't make these mortgage payments should interest rates change? Or am I just doing what I was trained to do, which is interest rates are low, incentives are to make loans, therefore I make loans. And then just sort of take a pass on the moral and ethical implications of I didn't do anything, I just did what I was trained to do. That's the problem, is that we can't take the pass on I just did what I was trained to do. We have a responsibility to use those tools in a way that promotes human flourishing. So the way I think about it is business is inherently social. I'm a social scientist, so this should be no surprise to anybody. And people look at me weird when I say business is inherently social. They look at me like I have two heads. What do you mean business is inherently social? I thought it was just about profit maximization and making money. It's no. Think about what you do in business. In business, you have that personal relationship between buyers and sellers. In business, you have that personal relationship between managers and employees. You have that relationship between suppliers and other vendors. Everything we do in business is a relationship with another human being. And this is why people get really upset whenever you do something that maybe mathematically makes sense or fits your training, and you, I don't know, shaft them, and then you look at them like, why are you angry? It's just business. Well, yeah, in your head, it's just business. In the other person's head who never drank from the Kool-Aid from business schools, they're sitting there going, no, this was, I thought, I'm a human being. I thought we had a relationship here. Don't you have an obligation to treat me like with some dignity and respect? Look, I was looking at Excel. We have to let people go. It's just business. And that's why people don't like that phrase. It's just business. Because deep down, as human beings, we understand it's more than just a transaction. That our interaction with other people are more than just naked transactions. They are, in fact, relationships where we are connected with other human beings. And that's the big problem we have, is that we have to bring back the humanity into business education. Or as one of my friends used to say, he taught labor economics, people aren't bricks. It would be so much easier if people were bricks, because then you could just interchange them. 
oh, this guy's not doing his job, just replace him with somebody else. Oh, we, that guy's not working out too well, we'll replace him with this dude. But people aren't bricks. We're all unique, diverse individuals who have completely individual hopes, dreams, and aspirations, and different talents and skills. Each and every one of us is unique. We're not perfectly interchangeable. This is the problem, is that human beings don't fit neatly into an Excel spreadsheet the way we would like to because, again, human beings are kind of difficult creatures. So we have to understand people aren't bricks, that these relationships we have matter, that people are, in fact, dignified, and we have to respect that inherent dignity within each individual person. So my perspective on this actually stemmed from these two gentlemen. The first job I had was as the Lundy Chair of the Philosophy of Business. It's a mouthful. And the reason this position came about, as was told to me by Norman Adrian Wiggins over here on your right, it was early 70s. And a businessman, Burroughs T. Lundy, and a university president, Norman Adrian Wiggins, they were commiserating about the sad, sorry state of business education in this country in the early 70s mind you. They were saying, it's just too technical. They're not learning why we do business. They're not learning the power of what it is we do. They're just learning skills. And we need to fix that. We need to correct that, otherwise it's going to take our country down. So they created this position. According to the Templeton Foundation, it was the first free enterprise chair created in the United States. And they said, you know what? We're going to be different. Every business student is going to have to take a philosophy of business class. And it's going to be that capstone class. So when they walk out, they not only have skills, they not only have tools, but they understand the morality and ethics that lie within the market process, that lie within the dignity of trade. And I heard this story when I applied and I was interviewed, but it didn't really click with me until maybe about two years in. So my first two years on the job, I taught it the way I would teach any other economics classes. It's, well, we're just maximizing utility. It's just efficient. And the more I taught the class, the more I thought about it, the more I examined my colleagues in the School of Business, the more I realized this class has to be more than just teaching about efficiency because nobody's going to die for efficiency. An economist might, but you know, we're special. But when you ask a human being, what would you die for? They would say things like love loyalty, freedom, but not efficiency. So now the question was, how do we get this to our students? How do we make this real for them in terms of, it's not just about understanding how markets work, it's about understanding how they can create that value for people. And for me, it was an education, understanding this big picture perspective that I'm sharing with you today. And uh, again, I didn't get it at first. It took a little bit of time. And now, wherever I go, this is my personal take. This is my personal brand of business needs to be humanized. It's not just about the skills. It has to be about people. It has to be about our humanity. It has to be about how do we improve the lives of people around us, and how do we use that tool to do it? I usually leave parents, when they come to visitation days, with this quote from the naturalist Edwin Way Teal. It is morally as bad not to care whether a thing is true or not, so long as it makes you feel good, as it is not to care how it is you got your money so long as you've got it. There's a lot of people out there who just care about getting money. How do I use my tools? Get money. And for me, that's not morally sufficient. We have to understand why we're getting it. We have to understand that the only way to ethically earn money is to create value for other people, is to do something that somebody else values, that enhances their life, and in the process of us doing it, we're able to conserve our scarce resources and keep our costs low so we can have that profit margin. That we have to think about the why as much as the how. When I think about principled entrepreneurs and how it is people go about creating value for others, I usually, because I minored in, or majored in biology for a while, I usually think of it as an ecosystem. Just as you wouldn't want to take your space helmet off if you're floating in space because you're going to die, because the ecosystem in space is not conducive for human survival. The same is true for entrepreneurs. If we don't create the right ecosystem for entrepreneurs, they aren't going to create value. 
what they'll end up doing is transferring wealth to their pockets and not create value. So what we need to do is understand how the rule of law matters. How having everybody understand what the rules of the game are, having everybody understand that nobody is above the law, that we all have to play by the same rules, having good governance, having that referee that unbiasedly enforces those rules, as opposed to being a player in the game, picking winners and losers. And then having economics, where we can be competitive and see whose ideas are better through the market process. It's having these three legs of this bar stool is what's necessary for principled entrepreneurship to work. It's only in that healthy environment that entrepreneurs are able to go out and create real value for people, as opposed to transferring wealth from others to their own pocket. But if you look at this, what you notice is this area of overlap in the Venn diagram is this small sort of pie-shaped region. And that's to help us remember that this is difficult. Getting these institutions working properly is difficult and it's hard to do, which is why we're lucky that our founders were able to set up institutions that put us within that pie-shaped wedge. Now, on the flip side, it also means that just because you're in the pie-shaped wedge doesn't mean you're gonna stay there forever. It is also very possible to migrate out of that pie-shaped wedge and create an environment that kills entrepreneurship. So just as it's difficult to achieve, it's also very easy to lose, which we have to be mindful of. How do these institutions impact the way we do business? How do these institutions impact our ability to create value for other people in our society so we can pull up all the boats and raise the standard of living for everybody. The way I explain it to my students, because my class is weird for them, is I put this up. So I'm probably one of the few business classes that actually makes my students read John Locke. So I had them read philosophy, and then I had them read the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and I had them read American legal history before we get into economics and such. And I tell them, look, here's the thing. In order to understand your role as a business person, we have to understand what's our philosophy? What's our mental model for what does it mean to be a human being? What does freedom mean? What does individuality mean? Why do individuals have dignity? We need that philosophy here. But that philosophy isn't just some great idea. That philosophy is directly going to impact the kind of government you end up with. And that government you end up with is directly going to impact your economic system which is gonna directly impact how it is you do business. That's why in my class we start with Locke, because we have to understand the base and work our way through it to understand what your appropriate role is in society, as opposed to just talking about the top of the pyramid and ignoring everything else. So this is where the liberal arts person in me comes in, because the liberal arts matter. Business students usually come in saying, I don't know why we're doing these gen eds, I just wanna be an accountant, or I just wanna do marketing. And I have to explain to them, your gen eds matter because they help you understand the human condition. Last I checked, you're gonna be operating in a world with other people. If you don't understand how people behave, you don't understand what motivates people, what, what drives them, what inspires them, how are you gonna to relate to them as a business person? Unless it's just purely transactional. So from my perspective, it's we have to train their minds and their hands, and we have to help them understand critical thinking, good communication, good writing, all the things that are taught in liberal arts colleges. And what's amazing, much to the chagrin of most business faculty, is most business schools, their stakeholders, usually end up saying, that's what we want. You're producing too many people who have really poor soft skills. We need people who can critically think. We need people who know how to communicate, as opposed to just tapping on things with their phone. Like when I hire a young person, I want to be able to have a conversation with them, as opposed to them looking at me going, I don't like know how to do this. Those are the soft skills that employers have been screaming about. There was actually a report, this was about five to 10 years ago, where some employers were saying they would rather hire liberal arts students than business students because they can train them in the business aspect. They can't train them on how to actually behave as a human being. And this is where it becomes really important of helping our students understand all these things are interconnected. It's not just about that skills acquisition. Now, sometimes people will say to me, but don't business skills matter? Sure, they matter. However, they're probably gonna become obsolete within five to 10 years because of the advent of changing technology. Business evolves constantly. 
what we want to do, and it's not just a throwaway phrase that higher ed uses, but we want people to be lifelong learners. We want people to be able to adjust as the market adjusts, evolve as markets evolve, evolve as technology changes. That's gonna be more than just memorizing how to do something today and then having to go get another degree later. It's about training somebody to be able to be an adaptive human being who can adapt as society adapts. So with all that said, I guess I would be remiss as an economist if I didn't get a little bit quantitative with things. There is a way to measure whether or not a country's in that pie-shaped wedge. I, I'm a theorist, so um, I take quantitative data sort of interestingly anyway. So one of the centers that I was a managing director for was at SMU. It was the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom. And the thing that I was most proud of was we basically, in that center, had the largest concentration of economic freedom scholars in the United States. Our team wrote the Economic Freedom of the World annual report. They worked on the Economic Freedom of North America annual report. And one of our scholars actually works on the economic freedom of cities. Economic freedom is their jam. And one of the things they do is they measure economic freedom across different countries. Now to make sure that nobody ever accuses them of being biased or political, because everything seems political now, they relied on data from the UN, data from the World Bank, data from the International Monetary Fund. They rely on other people's data, reputable people's data instead of creating their own. And they measure economic freedom along five areas. The first area is they look at the size of government, government expenditures, government-owned enterprises. They then look at legal structures and the security of property rights and the rule of law. They look at whether or not a country has sound money. They examine how much international trade countries have. And finally, they measure the amount of regulation that takes place in each of these countries. And they pull all this data together. It's actually really impressive how much data they have. And if you're curious, it is actually available for all of you if you want to download that and play with all of it. But they crank all that out and then begin ranking countries based on how much economic freedom these countries have. Or in other words, how well within that pie-shaped wedge are these different countries situated? The reason it's important is because economic freedom is that engine that enables principled entrepreneurs to utilize our diversity, utilize our talents to create value for others. And business education generally has forgotten this. So it's about understanding, again, our big role in society, what it is we are all here to do. So here's an interesting graph. Just to get it right off, we are not number one in economic freedom. In 2000, we were ranked second in the world in economic freedom right behind Hong Kong. That was the highest we've been. However, the reason I tell people this is not a political issue is because between 1980 and 2000, we had the greatest gains in economic freedom in American history. And that was under both Republicans and Democrats. For those of us old enough to remember, it was Bill Clinton who said, the era of big government's over. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. If you look from 2000 on, our economic freedom fell between 2000 and 2013. Just as Republicans and Democrats were really good at creating economic freedom over the previous 20 years, they were also equally as skilled as destroying our economic freedom over this 13 years. That's why I tell people it's not about politics. It's about do you understand what the ecosystem is that allows people to thrive? Not the color of the candidate's tie, but whether or not the candidate understands how we can improve the lives of other human beings, how it is we can alleviate poverty in this country by being able to empower people to use the skills that they are already imbued with and be free to do so. Again, if you look at from 2013 on, between 2013 and 2020, we all know was sort of a weird year for everybody. We saw economic freedom go back up under both Democrats and Republicans, under both President Obama and President Trump. It's not about politics. That's the easy way out. Ideas are hard, 
but that's why they matter. If you think about it, people usually make fun of Canada as being like our socialist neighbor to the north with uh, government health care. If you look at between 2009 and 2015, Canada actually had more economic freedom than we did. For that time from Canada technically was more capitalist than we were. This is why ideas matter. You can believe that we have free enterprise. You can believe all sorts of things. The question is really whether or not it's true. The question is, are we actually creating value for people? Are we actually freeing entrepreneurs to create job opportunities? Or are we shackling people? That's why it's not political. But why does it matter? Well, if you look at this, what you see is that the countries in the highest quartile earn, on average, eight times more than people in the lowest quartile. So people in the most economically free countries, on average, earn eight times more than people in the least economically free countries. And oftentimes, I'll get people saying, yep, see, I knew it. You're an economist. All you care about is making people money. No, I'm an economist. You are correct with that. But much like Adam Smith, I care about why are people poor? And how do we solve that poverty problem? So if we look at the income for the poorest 10%, what you see is that the income for the poorest 10% in the most economically free countries is eight times greater than the average income of the poorest 10% in the least economically free countries. If you want to help poverty and alleviate poverty, we need to free people. We need to provide for them that ability to use their skills, use their talents, create opportunities, use business skills in a way that's productive and pro-human. This pulls people out of poverty. If we look at the poverty rates between the most free and the least free, if you look at the least free, over 70% of people there live under $7 a day. That's a lot of people living under $7 a day. If you look at the most free, 5.5% of people experience that kind of poverty. If we want to alleviate poverty, if we want to improve life on the planet, it's pretty simple. Free people. Give us a chance to use those skills and talents we were born with to create value for people in our community, to create value for other folks, to be able to be productive and do things that are a calling for us as opposed to just getting a job. Be, having a vocation in the real meaning of the term vocation, as in why were you put on this planet and how are you going to make it better and how are you going to make a difference? Sometimes I'll get people saying, well, yeah, yeah, you can make more money with more economic freedom, but it's going to lead to more income inequality. Eh, nope. That's not what the data says. This is a distribution of income. So the income share of the poorest 10%. It's a flat line. Having more economic freedom, empowering people to use your creativity to create value for others, raising our income, raising income for poor people, reducing poverty, does not increase income inequality, according to the data. That's a myth. If you're freeing all people, it means that all people have an opportunity to pull themselves up. So the idea of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, we're not seeing that. It's a great story. It's a great narrative if you, know, you need a story, but the data doesn't pan that out. I'm a big fan of life expectancy. Mainly as I get older, I like expect life expectancy to go up. One of the nice things about this is that most economically free countries, on average, live 15 years longer than people in the least free. Now, for those of you young students, you're like, oh, I'm invincible. I can go drink green beer tonight, and it'll be fine, and I'll be OK for my 8 AM class. It's, it's all good. Here's the thing. 15 years is the difference between knowing your grandparents. Think about how much human knowledge would get lost if you lose a generation of people who can actually tell you, you know, we tried that. It didn't work out so well. You could do that, but yeah, we did it too. And yeah, don't, don't do that. Learn from our mistakes. We know you don't listen to your parents, but you listen to your grandparents. Well, if you don't have grandparents, then what do you have? You lose human knowledge. You, use, you lose human experience. So it helps us live longer. And I'm not a happiness expert, but at least according to the data, people who live in the most economically free countries tend to be happier. But that seems to make more sense. If you have lower levels of poverty, if you have the freedom to pursue what it is your calling is, 
you're generally going to have a much more fulfilled life than not being able to do that. Economic freedom is also associated with greater employment, less corruption, more civil rights, a cleaner environment, and lower infant mortality rates. Those are all really cool things. More income, greater civil rights, cleaner environments. The question I always have for people is, is there anybody who doesn't like any of these things? Yeah, I, I want a dirtier environment. I want more corruption. I want more people to be unemployed. Anybody? Anybody just like hate these things? Unless you're a sociopath, every human being wants these things. We want a better life for ourselves. We want a better life for our children. We all want these things. Most of their problems is the fact that we argue with each other how to get these things. But we care about innately the same human issues. The upside with being an economist, we actually have data on how to get there, how to make these things real, how to pull ourselves out of these conundrums, if you will. So I guess it begs the question, where are we today? Where's the United States? I remember back nine years ago where I'm doing media for this, and it's sad. We're having to explain to people, the United States is ranked 16th in the world in economic freedom. We're barely in the top 20. Canada's outpacing us. I, I remember those days. And where we're at now, we're fifth in the world. We're climbing back up, which is good for our economy, which is good for human flourishing. It's good for people wanting to have a better world. But it also means we could still do better. Now, why is this important if you're sitting there going, yeah, but I just want a job. I just want to you know, live my life. I don't want to think about these big picture ideas. That's just not my jam, man. I just, I just want a J-O-B. Well, here's why it matters. Businesses are going to move places where it's easier to do business. So if you want that J-O-B, this kind of matters just a little bit. For example, in 2011, over 200 companies left California. And, and I bring that up because I'm a Californian. I'm a native Californian. And people are fleeing my home state. Like, I have fled my home state. Chevron, Waste Connections, they ended up moving to Texas. Occidental Petroleum moved to Texas. A lot of people moved to Texas. Campbell Soup shut down their plant in Sacramento. Toyota, which was a staple and a huge employer in Southern California, picked up and left for Dallas. When you kill economic freedom, businesses aren't dumb. They're going to move someplace else where it's easier to do what it is they're doing. So for those of you who like empirics, let's look at the cost of renting a U-Haul. Going from Plano, Texas to Torrance was 1200 bucks. But going from Torrance to Plano, Texas, that was going to be $2,600. Going from LA to Dallas, $25. But going the other way, half that. You don't have to be an economist to figure out, it seems like more people are going from California to Texas than there are Texans going to California based off of these prices. And that's what we were seeing. And that's what we've continued to see over the last decade. It's this flight out of places like California. California and New York are traditionally usually at the bottom of the economic freedom list for North America and for the 50 states. This is why it matters for you, especially if you're a college student looking for that J-O-B when you graduate. How economically friendly is where you live? How economically friendly is the environment you're going to grow up in? where you're going to work in. So according to the Economic Freedom of North America, Ohio is ranked 33rd in the country. If Ohio was a student of mine, I would probably sit down and go, you're on the wrong side of the midpoint. You can do better. That is the upside, actually. You know, there's lots of room for improvement. Gains could be made dramatically. But if we're being comparative, what we have to look at is, what are your neighbors? Indiana is ranked ninth in the country. Pennsylvania is ranked 16th in the country. Michigan's ranked 31st in the country. Places where it's easier to do business, you're going to start seeing people going to those places instead of staying here, creating jobs here, creating wealth here, creating opportunities here, being able to grow all the resources 
and just the wonders of what is Ohio. That's the danger, is that people will move to places where it's easier to do business. The upside, I suppose, for Ohio is that you're better than Kentucky, and you're better than West Virginia. So that's a positive. On the negative side, though, you have lots of competition who are looking for your young graduates and looking to hire them to create value and wealth for their state. When I think about economic freedom, I always think about this in terms of what the average world income is. Average world income, and I just cranked these numbers out over the course of the weekend, average world income according to the International Monetary Fund is 13,870 bucks. And you're like, why did you bring that up? Because the poverty level for an individual in the United States is $15,000. Average income is 13,000. Poverty in the United States is 15,000. Think about what that means. In this country, we define average as being impoverished. Average world income lands you in poverty in the United States. That's how well our economic engine has worked. This is why people look at me weird when I say things like, I want to bring average world income to our poverty level. And they're just like, that sounds awful. But that's the reality of it. We have done so well that we define being average as impoverished. How much does it make to become a one percenter in the world? Forget a one percenter in the United States. A one percenter in the world. According to CNN, so you know this isn't just sort of like you know left wing right wing thing. This is CNN, so you know it's not at least not going to be super business friendly. Thirty four thousand dollars in two thousand twelve. I adjusted that for inflation. It comes out to about forty seven thousand dollars today. If you're making over $47,000 in the United States today, you are in the 1% of wage earners in the world. That means most of our college graduates are gonna be roughly right around that five to 1% wage earners in the world. That's the beauty of what it is we've been able to accomplish, but it also is the beauty of what it is we can share with other people to help eliminate poverty, to help raise the standards of living. I looked it up earlier today on what per capita income is for Ohio. It was 2022 data, and my recollection was that it was over, slightly over, $65,000. That was per capita income in Ohio. That means per capita, the average income in Ohio puts you almost 20K above being a one percenter in the world. We have to understand the big picture that we've had an opportunity to grow our economy in a way that other people on this planet can only dream of. But it also means that we have the opportunity to lose it if we're not careful, destroy it if we're being negligent or not keeping eyes on how we got here. But more importantly, we can share this to help other people have the kind of growth, the kind of development, the kind of flourishing that we've had here. So here's my concern. If economic freedom falls, will human flourishing fall with it? Will our ability to alleviate poverty, will our ability to have happier lives, will our ability to earn more money, our ability to have a world where our kids can say, yeah, I think it's gonna be better than my, my parents had it, as opposed to where we live today where kids think that their life is gonna be significantly worse than what their parents had. That's a problem. So here's my takeaways for today. Business education in the United States of America has failed because all we do is train hands. We have to train minds as well. We have to train people why we do business, what role you play, how you can tap into and unleash that economic power in each individual. Two, our economic freedom has fallen for most of this century. It's kind of weird, we're far enough in that I can say it's this century. But for the vast majority of the century, it's been going down. We were lucky it went up, tanked a little bit during COVID. But where is it going to go next? How are we going to make sure that we can still have the ecosystem that's going to be healthy for our kids, that's going to be healthy for our grandkids? And my argument is that you can help reverse this trend. Now, if you're a college student, you're sitting there like, what can I do? How can I help reverse this trend? Simple. Dig into ideas. Dig into these ideas that the George Washington Forum engages you in, on why it is institutions matter, why it is getting the rule of law understood, having good governance, 
understanding how economics works, why these things matter. Because ideas can change the world. So dig into these ideas when you're given that opportunity. Get your friends interested in ideas. Most of real college learning takes place when you're sitting around the cafeteria actually engaging each other in conversation. It doesn't take place in the classroom. I've taught long enough to not be that delusional. Real education takes place when you sit down with your friend and you're actually arguing about stuff you talked about in class. And it gives you a chance to try these ideas on to see whether or not you buy it, don't buy it, and whether or not they fit. Get engaged. Places like the George Washington Forum have opportunities for students to be able to dig into these things. There are other places on campus that engage students. Get engaged. A college education is more than just passing the exams. You're not getting your money's worth off. All you do is show up to class and pass your exams. You have to take the ideas, play with them, learn from each other. You need to live by your ideals. And more importantly, you have to support the faculty who can help give you these opportunities to expand your horizons. Now, for those of you who aren't students and are community members, here's the upside for all of you. You have an opportunity to shape and change young people's lives. You have an opportunity to go and help improve somebody's collegiate education and help them understand the big picture through supporting these opportunities, through supporting places like the George Washington Forum, through supporting faculty, supporting the university. You change lives. And if you look around, the lives you're changing are right around you. There's so much untapped potential in the room, whether you're a student or a community member. You can make a difference. And I think that's the big takeaways. Oftentimes we feel like we don't have the power to make a difference. But in fact, you do. At the end of the day, here's my takeaway. Business is relational. It's not transactional. Human beings do business. Human beings are involved in business. We have to understand how it is human beings can thrive. It's not just about, is your Excel spreadsheet right? Is your business plan correct? I've seen so many business plans where they ignore, what are you trying to create for other people? If you want more information, you can download all the reports and all the data from the Economic Freedom of the World Annual Reports and the Economic Freedom of North America Annual Reports over at freetheworld.com. So all that data is readily available to you. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time. Thank you for spending the evening here with me. And I'm going to open it up to questions in the, I think, eight minutes we have left. Wow, this is like one of my classes. Are there any questions? It's like I couldn't have been perfectly clear. Yeah. Here. I'm, so I'm a grad student finishing up going into K-12 classical education, so a lot of this is right up my alley. As you think through, like, what is your ideal freshman coming into your business program? What is he or she prepared and educated in already? It's funny because I've actually had to deal with what I in fact get <laughs> as opposed to what my ideal is. My ideal would be somebody who understands that they don't have all the answers, somebody who's intellectually humble and knows that there's still a whole world out there for them to learn, but also somebody who's curious, somebody who wants to figure out where they fit into the world, somebody who is trying to figure out how they matter. Because oftentimes, when you're 18, we have all sorts of delusions of grandeur when we're 18. That doesn't mean that they're all right. And this is a great opportunity for us to be able to explore who you are as a person. But you have to understand that higher education, being that first year student, is really a process in and of itself in understanding who you are and self-actualizing and beginning to understand how you can make a dent in the world. So for me, it's the ideal student is somebody who is contemplative, somebody who understands that learning is a huge privilege because we have other things we could be doing instead, but instead of having a job, we're doing this. It's somebody who's curious, intellectually curious, and understands that Higher education is an end in and of itself. It's not a means to an end. Oftentimes, that's how we sell it, is as a means to an end. And everybody treats it as a means to an end. 
But being educated is an end of itself in terms of understanding and having a deeper appreciation for that human condition. So for me, it's about the innate curiosity, that humility, and that inquisitiveness. Everything else you're gonna figure out over the course of those four years. That's what the whole process is set up to do. Uh, ideally though, I would also like somebody who is able to communicate. Uh, there's all that skills acquisition stuff, but at the end of the day, you're gonna learn those things while you're in college. What I can't teach you is that mindset of, let's think about the big picture. I, I had a student once, I w when I was an academic advisor, I had this student walk in, like all bouncy and sort of all full of pep and energy, he comes into my office and I'm Dr. Buzzkill. And I'm like, okay. She's like, oh, hi, I'm one of your new advisees. It's great to meet you. Okay, this is way too early in the morning for this. What do you wanna do? I wanna get as many degrees as possible. Why on God's earth do you wanna do that? And they're like, what? Look, I have all these things up on the wall. That's expensive wallpaper. Why do you want to do that? What's the purpose? She's like, I don't know. Okay, we have about a month and a half between now and when I have to actually advise you. Please spend that time and ask yourself, what do you want to get out of this? What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to be in five years? How do you think you can make a difference? And you're not going to make a difference by getting every degree possible. What's in it for you? Why are you here? And she's just like, whoa, those are like big think questions. Great, go sit under a tree then, and then contemplate. But it's not just about checking these boxes. That's the downside. Um, so, you know, my hat's off to you. If you're gonna go out and teach young kids, that is, that's incredible. I train high school teachers as part of what I do for SMU. And I understand how tough that can be. But what you would end up doing for them would be, hugely important, and I kind of benefit from it when they actually get to college too. So yeah, I do have something in it. But did that help? Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? I don't know if we have any more time. Yes. Two questions. Number one, I like the website you showed us a slide ago. Yeah. Number two, on the chart before the US Canada, yeah. that you talked about different things measured that you, that, mm -hmm. you know, objective data. Um, I would like, I'm interested to know which of those things help economic freedom and which don't. I know okay. the tax rate for me, Texas and California already. Right. So the higher the tax rates, that's going to harm economic freedom. That would be a negative impact on area one. More government expenditures would hurt economic freedom and be a negative impact on area one. And things like more government owned enterprises would hurt economic freedom. Uh, our big hit was actually during the 2005 Kilo case, the eminent domain case. That was big back then. That harmed our property rights protection dramatically for the nation. You know, anytime, as Sandra Day O'Connor would put it, anytime property can be taken by the government so it can be upgraded, your private property isn't protected. And that's gonna seriously hurt whether or not we can develop property and our ownership of rights if the government can just come in and seize it and provide us just compensation. Uh, same thing with freedom to trade internationally. The more free we are to trade internationally, the higher our score is, and the lower amounts of credit regulation, business regulation, labor regulation, the easier it is for people to go get jobs, the higher our economic freedom score would be. So, does that help? Awesome. That's all a question in the back, yes. So, uh, you mentioned the statistics uh, about uh, some survey, I think it was 2006, of business leaders, mm -hmm. uh, and who they uh, had a preference to hire. Mm -hmm. uh, they want people, employees who not mm -hmm. think, okay? Uh, I, I read a couple of articles like that. I raised this question once with uh, someone who I won't name, but someone in authority, mm -hmm. and the response was that that's what they say in these surveys, but then the people they actually hire are the ones who have gotten their business degrees. Is there, is, what is your reaction to that, and where can you actually find good data on who businesses hire? Right. What, for what colleges do they hire? I don't know where we can get good data, and all the stories we have are anecdotal. So that's sort of the problem here is, there were Newsweek articles, USA Today articles, US News and World Report articles in the mid 20 teens about how employers were hiring English majors, hiring humanities majors, and not business majors. And even talking to some business folks 
when I was hired at one university, I met with our alums, and this was before I even set foot on campus, and they sat me down and said, look, our business students, they're really good at business. They just don't know how to be a human being. You need to fix that. I'm just like, you do understand I'm not the dean, right? That's above my pay grade. What I can do is begin with this freshman cohort and begin helping people understand critical thinking matters, writing matters, being able to understand where human beings are coming from matter, and I can begin reversing that trend internally over time, but this is a conversation you need to have with the dean because we would have to change our curriculum dramatically in order to address the fact that our students are highly skilled, but they just don't show very well, and people are willing to hire folks from other schools. So unfortunately, I don't have really good solid data for you other than the anecdotal data that was very prevalent during the mid-20-teens. Yeah, I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in the last several years, uh, there has been um, a lot of online teaching. Mm -hmm. And I have some professor friends, uh, and I've asked them how good that has been. And uniformly, they say they don't think the students are learning as much because of the interaction is missing. No matter how good the the, the technical side of the presentation is, it just isn't there. Uh, have you had any experience with that? So up until the pandemic, I was adamantly opposed to online education for that very reason. My argument was, there's a reason why throughout human history, education has always taken place face to face. There's something about this interconnectedness of us being in a room together, having a conversation together, where we can begin bouncing ideas off each other and having that organic growth of knowledge. Since the pandemic, I'm still pretty much on that train. However, I'm also of the opinion that if you do online education well, you can have a similar impact, but it requires a lot of upfront costs that I'm not sure faculty want to do. And I'm saying that from personal experience. Having transitioned my business dynamics and business philosophy class online during the pandemic, I spent more time learning how to be an audio engineer so I can record my lectures and have them sound well so the students aren't distracted by things like breath sounds and noises and they can just focus on what I'm talking to them about and the slides that they're listening to. And the results that I was getting in terms of the feedback from the students, like the question I always ask is, what was the most important thing you learned and why? The responses were very interesting because they were about as good as what I used to get face to face. And the one thing that students kept telling me was what I like about it is I can just go back and re-listen to you. It's not like face to face where after our class is over, we now have a new class. It's I can go back and re-listen re to that lecture you had on John Locke. I can go back and listen to that lecture you had on how it is our best of intentions sometimes lead to unintended consequences. And it never crossed my mind that just that repeatability actually mattered a lot to some of these students because especially for the ones where it focused on comparative advantage and are using our uniquenesses to create value for others. It was touching when I read this one person's journal article who said, the most important thing I learned was I can make a difference. That everybody's special, everybody has a talent, everybody has a way to create value for others, and I never thought about myself as having a talent that can create value to others. And I listened to that lecture over and over and over again, and that's what's been the most important thing to me is this idea that I can go out and create value for another human being and I can earn money doing something I'm good at but I'm also benefiting the people around me and that I have this uniqueness. I, mean, I, I sat there reading it going, oh my God, this is kind of on one hand very depressing but on the other hand, it's that's the kind of impact we can have on our students even if you use the second best medium of online learning. That's why, for me, it's about how do we fund faculty? How do we fund organizations that can provide that kind of impact for students? Change those lives, because that person is gonna have a completely different trajectory now than they would have had if they never had that video to listen to. So, yes, personally, I'm a huge fan of face-to-face. -face. I think this can't be replicated. But on the other hand, I think if you do it well, you can get a pretty good second best. I, I teach a class on the intellectual history of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally on board your bigger premise. Um, I'm curious, we seem like we're also in an inflection point about 
higher education, generally speaking, as a society. And I'm wondering, somebody gave you the keys to the kingdom and said, what's the type of, of, of college experience students should have to help train them in the way that you would see them be trained? I would like a college experience like the kind of college experience I wish I had. I was a commuting student. So for the first three years of my collegiate career, I was the poor schmuck who would drive to campus, take my classes, drive home. I didn't get an, an, a chance to embrace the extracurriculars. I didn't get a chance to embrace the collegiate exchange of ideas. And for me, that's where higher ed can make a big difference, is tapping into the diversity that is within our student body and creating that dialogue amongst people so we can learn from each other. Having it be an open conversation where we get to have that marketplace of ideas and have students understand when they come into it that it is a marketplace for ideas. Some of these ideas you're gonna, you're gonna love and you're gonna sort of beat the drum for. Other ideas, they might scare you, they might frighten you, they might offend you. But welcome to humanity. We have to engage those ideas. We have to engage each other and learn. Why do you have that POV? Why do I have my point of view? And what can we learn from each other? So for me, the ideal higher ed experience is gonna be one that is much more holistic about what does it mean to be a college student? How do we give those college students all the advantages they need, not to just do well in class, but have those extracurriculars that give them a chance to flourish as human beings. Engage in those hard conversations because they're not having them in high school and they're not having them at home anymore. We're stuck with, high, with tech where we're stuck in this world of we live in our echo chambers and we only read people who agree with us. The beauty of college and higher ed is you get to be in a world where not everybody agrees with you, deal with it. That's where real learning begins. That's where a real civil society comes from, is understanding we're all different, we're all gonna have different points of view, and how do we coexist? And how do we create value and find those win-wins? Um, Dr. Roday. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonas.